Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So on December the 3rd, 2019, I shared a document that is from 1984 and it was released by the CIA or declassified on the 9th of September 2003. And this was authored by one Tom Bearden and it discusses the applications both realised and implied by the bomb Aronoff effect. This was a tip-off given to me by... John Hutchison and I gave the link to the document and the document is here and I've selected a page for its importance and here we have Brezhnev's 1975 proposal and this was at the SALT talks on June the 13th 1975. It says the Soviets urged the US to agree on a ban of research and development of new kinds of weapons more terrible than the world had ever seen. And these are non-nuclear weapons, although I believe that they can stimulate uh, nuclear, nuclear effects. And these were talked about, effectively they are Tesla-based weapons and they're scalar electromagnetic weapons. And he talks about them in his book, Further Lance. This is Tom Bearden. And this was published first in 1986, so two years after the briefing document here that was formally classified. And he also has a follow-up book here, and I will look at some sections from that as we go through this presentation. Now, this is a classic image from this document, which you can get freely online. This is also in the 1986 book and this is about having a scalar wave transmitter here, scalar wave transmitter here and then you have interferometer zone here in the middle where you have an energy bottle and you can do various things with that bottle. You can pump energy in and you can pump energy out and this can be on absolutely incredible scales. So for instance here it's saying that you have energy peaks here, and if they're troughs, uh, maybe troughs instead of peaks. In that case, energy is extracted. So what you can do is you can create weather systems by uh, cooling areas down. So, for instance, if you wanted a drought in California, you can make that area hot and dry uh, at a particular point in the atmosphere so that it wouldn't cause any precipitation. If you wanted to make, for instance, this area have a st stupid cold environment, you could do that by extracting energy. And if you wanted to create some weather systems down in the Gulf because you wanted to achieve some goals that way, you could make one area hot and one area cold and the combination of the two would yield some weather system that sort of self-generates and then you can guide it actually with the processes as well. And so you can understand why they really advise that they weren't developed. And you can do all kinds of things like tracking devices, directing energy and extracting energy. You can create non-nuclear explosions, shields, uh, all kinds of things. So here is a, uh, a sort of uh, explosive generator bank uh, for producing the control and phasing this section here and so on to uh, emit your rays and this would create what he calls it a Tesla howitzer. So it, it creates an explosive event at a point in the distance. And there's no actual projectile sent here. It's all done through scalar wave and so forth. So it's, it's a really interesting read. What are scalar waves? Well, he explains it here, scalar O wave production. Essentially, he describes it on the following page. I'll just read it here. It says, to make a scalar beam, special modifications are made to the EM wave transmitter so that effectively the transmitter transmits multiple transmissions simultaneously and these vectorially sum to zero. This is the same thing as transmitting multiple phase-locked electromagnetic force field beams simultaneously in the sum zeroed fashion. And he says, these substructure components constitute bonds, hidden variables. They can be manipulated and varied at will. Phasing, beaming, frequency, superposition, interference, resonance, and Fourier expansion are keys to scalar electromagnetic engineering. And so uh, you can see in this uh, diagram here, you've got a, a virtual ground and it's a virtual ground because you've got two waves transmitted simultaneously and they cancel each other out. But the net effect of those is that you actually have a, a compression in one sort of phase and a, a, a tension in the other. So you are effectively stressing or either compressing or, or pulling 
um, apart uh, the structure of the physical vacuum and he calls this a stress level on space time. So there we go that's a little introduction. The reason I wanted to talk about this is through rather circuitous route I came across a patent it's awarded patent it has priority December the 28th 2011 and it's to the company Lockheed Martin Corporation and it's a systems and methods for generating coherent matter wave beams. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into it and you'll see some explanations here. So effectively, what we have here is a sort of a cathode and an anode. So this could be like a, a, a John Hutchison or a Tesla Van de Graaff generator or Tesla coil with half million volts. And this is your ground. So you have your electrostatic potential. And then you have a magnetic field here. And then you have a whole bunch of coupled resonant cavities. And this whole distance here is 10 microns. So you can imagine that this is not a very large thing. Anyway, this will be explained. And he has a B field here. And actually, John Hutchison would very often have a very strong magnet in his environment as part of his experiments. I'll just get into the text of it because that's where the interesting bits are. Coherent massless particle beams such as lasers have been successful and spawned many disruptive technologies. A massive counterpart to lasers, namely coherent matter wave beams, may hold the promise of similar and even more revolutionary technologies. Generating massive coherent beams, however, has been elusive. A major obstacle in producing coherence in matter waves is to change the phase of beam particles without modifying the energy of the particles. Conventional phase modifying effects may lead to a change in the energy, thus modifying the wavelength of the particles and making it difficult to synchronize the particles for coherence. This is a very important concept. So it actually explains it later down and you'll get the idea of what's going on and why. Okay, so... According to various aspects of the subject technology, a directed beam of low entropy, coherent massive particles similar to laser beams may be produced, but with concentrations millions of times higher than any intense laser beams currently available. Furthermore, unlike laser beams or the Bose-Einstein condensate, e.g. a form of coherent matter wave, the subject technology may produce coherent matter waves that allow both fermions and bosons to achieve coherence. That's very, very important. So it's like a coherent electron laser uh, or even a coherent whatever matter laser. According to various aspects of the subject technology, Intense directed coherent matter wave beams of particles for bosons, e.g. particles with integer spins, or fermions, e.g. particles with half integer spins, neutral or charged may be produced. So, one might think that the zero entropy would mean absolute zero. So, you know, it's basically not hot. The energy stored in these beams may have virtually zero entropy. So it may have virtually zero entropy, allowing for experimenting with physics in unexplored territories. Coherence in matter waves, and in particular in fermions, may be beyond the reach of conventional technologies unless the temperature can be reduced to near zero. However, even this approach may only work for bosons using the conventional technologies. Aspects of the subject technology may produce coherence for bosons as well as for fermions, while obviating the use of cryogenics or other technology to implement near zero temperatures. Thus, room temperature coherence for bosons as well as for fermions may be produced. Okay, so I've got here the importance of neutral matter wave beams. So effectively, this is something that can contain a lot of matter and be in a coherent beam but have no net charge. According to certain aspects, the aronhoff bomb ab effect may be used as a stipulant under a noise-seeded resonance condition to induce coherence in matter waves. The AB effect is a demonstrated quantum mechanical effect that can modify a physical system solely through its geometrical parameters without changing any physical quantity. According to the AB effect, 
the angular phase of a particle inside a vector potential can change even if there are no forces or fields acting on the particle. The AB effect was predicted in 1959 by Aharonov and Bomb and physically demonstrated by Tonomura in 1986. That's the same time as the Ferdelance book was published. Now, the implication of the Ferdelance book and the 1984 or whatever it is briefing document I showed you before is that some of these things had been well studied even before then. So they talk about phase unification here. The phase unification, known as coherence, may make it possible to assign a single and simple wave function to a large number of photons, n, and provide a local field energy that scales with n squared. By doing so, a single wave whose amplitude is simply n times the amplitude of a single photon wave may be achieved with energy that is n squared times the energy of a single photon. Fortunately, this dramatic energy enhancement due to phase synchronization of photons is not limited to electromagnetic waves alone. Rather, it is a property of wave phenomena and may be applicable to all kinds of waves. According to quantum mechanics, particles may be waves, e.g. de Broglie waves, and may be subject to this phase coherence. However, Creating coherence among particle waves, e.g. matter waves, may not be as easy as it is for photon waves. And so far, using conventional technologies, the only achievable coherent matter wave has been at near absolute zero temperatures. And for a very small number of particles, e.g. in the order of thousands or millions of particles, and only for bosons. Well... I disagree, and I think in the coming weeks you will see why I disagree. But anyway, that's what this patent uh, from Lockheed Martin says. Matter wave coherence for streaming particles, ED beams, may open the door to many new technologies and many potential new applications. Matter wave particles carry mass, and thus the potential for concentrating energy to densities far beyond what massless photons are capable of may be much higher. Furthermore, coherent matter waves may allow fermions, e.g. electrons, as well as bosons, e.g. photons, to achieve coherence. Examples of applications for coherent matter wave beams may include single bar thermal energy extraction. This is what I was showing you in that 1984 briefing document, where you are sucking energy uh, out of a, a distant environment. And actually, John Hutchison said to me that sometimes he would turn on his equipment to create a cool environment when he was working in the hot summers. Maybe he was actually achieving some of this extraction of heat from a distance. Ultra-sensitive accelerometers and interferometric tracking of air spacecrafts. This is exactly what it says in that 1984 document. A more accurate alternative to global positioning systems, and I would suspect that this would work in the sea, inside buildings, in the air, and in space. Matter wave projectiles and missiles, directed energy weapons, matter wave optics, and cloaking. Cloaking? This is where light is able to go through it and reflect off the thing behind and come back. There's a researcher out there called Thunderfoot and I think he did an experiment where they got I think it was potassium and sodium mixed it together and put it onto water and they used very high speed photography and what they observed is that this silvery metal as it was going around on the water first it was silver and it was going around on the water then it went I think black and then it goes absolutely transparent so something is happening something is going on in that mixed metal such that it's changing its optical properties. It's going from being something that light cannot pass through and it reflects to something that light can completely go through. And then it suddenly, all of a sudden, you have this explosion in the form of the sodium and potassium on water. And 
the explosion it was found out or su supposed uh, much later down the line that this was a columbic explosion this means there is far too many electrons than the material could hold itself together with so they went in they went in they went in now you know you could argue how that would happen so so it's actually changing optics the other thing is, is you could you know, make something potentially, just like you can put energy in, you could extract it. So you, you could maybe change the optics of a an area of space, like say somewhere up in the sky, and you could make it appear like it's almost like a solid, like certainly like light's not able to get through it very much. So for instance, in, in a military application, you might have like a, you, you might have a building you wanted to knock down. So I've got this uh, little adapter here is my virtual building. And in here, I've got my Tomahawk cruise missile and it's coming in like this, like this. Now, yeah, I didn't want anyone to see that this is a Tomahawk cruise missile. So you use this scalar interferometry with a template and you basically overlay the mask of, say, an, an aircraft or something like that. You know the position precisely of your Tomahawk cruise missile. And you just overlay this sort of black blob. I mean, it's, it's not great, but you, you're basically changing the optics around the, the device to cloak it. Uh, literally, it says, and cloaking. So you're literally throwing a cloak over this thing in the shape of a plane. And it comes in. Now, the, the problem is... Of course, that um, you know, if you if you wanted everyone to see the illusion from this side, you would have to keep the illusion going for all of the time that that it's uh, going into the building that you're attacking. But uh, uh, the problem is, is if it if the building isn't as wide as the illusion, and you don't turn the illusion off soon enough, then the the illusion might po poke out the other side, so people might see something that doesn't look like anything's happened to it, but it's coming out the other side. So you need to be very careful. And really what you would want is you would want to have a mask for your illusion. You would want to have that mask so that uh, it then changes at the point that it starts to go through the building. The other thing is if you had a, like an impact explosion or some sort of explosion for whatever reason, the plasma there would change the, the um, nature of the physical vacuum. And, and that, that would mask also this illusion. But if, if the illusion got outside, uh, you know, the, the, the vectors of, of the uh, scalar interferometry uh, got to a point where um, it was outside the plasma, you would see the, the nose cone again. So you, you would basically have to be very clever. But the most important thing is you'd want to keep the illusion of whatever it was that's going into the building. And actually, in this other book by Tom Bearden here, he talks about the scalar interferometry. And you can see the same graphic here as it had in the 1984 paper. And it says here, energy effect in distant zone may be either heating or cooling and slow rising or fast explosive. So you can slowly rise it up like you're having a warm day or you can literally blow stuff up. Um, specific patterns of local ST curvature, space-time curvature and dynamics engines may also be produced. So if you wanted to create a pattern within a, you know, the, the interfering uh, uh, zone, um, you can effectively create a, a change in the way the local space-time interacts with light. So this is effectively changing its dielectrical properties or, or, or making it so it can't pass light or whatever. So um, you can en end up creating some sort of cloak there. So he's describing it here in uh, this book. Beams easily pass through the Earth or the ocean whose internal fields and potentials are superhighways for in internal longitudinal EM waves. Anyway, so there you go. So that is the cloaking. Now, matter wave emission and propulsion. So you can actually use this as a propulsion system. Matter wave solitons, high energy collision, high precision matter optics, atomic clocks, tests of physics constants, and other suitable applications. So what this is saying here is basically many of the things that John Hutchison demonstrated from 1979 onwards that was known to the Soviets, possibly at least in theory, from 1976. And it would seem that they had some of these things developed by the 1980s. In fact, the Duger array was apparently a scalar interferometer, according to Bearden. And this could be used to create weather systems, earthquakes, volcanoes, trigger them. You, you energize the, the tectonic plates and so forth. But what you are seeing here is... Um, Essentially, Lockheed Martin, one if not the biggest Western military contractor, being awarded a patent that says we can do this and this is what it does. According to aspects of 
the subject technology, the AB effect, e.g. phase modifying process without energy exchange, can be used to modify the phase of massive particles and make the massive particles coherent. According to the least action principle, a physical system can evolve until the system's available energy reaches a minimum or a maximum. The system may be stable when the minimum in the energy is reached. A system of weakly coupled oscillators may self-organize because the energy exchanged may be minimized when constituents move in harmony, e.g. in phase. It is not complex to show mathematically that when a random oscillator joins an organized crowd, its phase may move gradually towards the phase of the crowd. This exchange of energy to achieve coherence, however, may only work for macroscopic systems. To achieve coherence in particles, the particle's de Broglie phase may need to be modified without exchanging energy. Exchanging energy modifies the de Broglie wavelength frequency, thereby making it difficult to synchronize. Since the AB effect is a quantum mechanical effect that can affect matter without causing the exchange of any physical quantity, the AB effect may be used to change the phase of massive particles and produce coherent matter wave beams. Furthermore, AB induced coherence for the production of matter waves does not differentiate between bosons and fermions. In contrast, the conventional approach for producing coherent matter, the Bose-Einstein condensate, only works for bosons and only at very low temperatures, e.g. near zero, that's zero Kelvin temperatures. Coherence can be more easily achieved under the influence of resonance. In a noise-grown resonance, a cavity can be filled with many waves of different wavelengths. Of this multitude of waves, a few may happen to have the right wavelength and the right phase to resonate. As a stipulant acts on these waves in the cavity, more resonantly correct waves may join the resonance and the supposed e.g. coherent wave may grow. The unfit waves, which do not have the proper wavelength and the proper phase to join the resonance, may wither and eventually disappear, e.g. transfer the last of their energy to the resonant waves through collision and die out. According to certain aspects, interconnected microcavities may be filled with particles, e.g. atoms, molecules, etc. And the AB effect may be used to grow resonance and consequently coherence in the matter waves in each cavity. Resonance, like self-coherence, can be achieved by itself under proper conditions. However, the process may be slow and may utilize sub-nanometer cavities to grow. Overmoded resonances may be possible in larger, e.g. a few nanometers, cavities, but that introduces multiple phases and may be subject to more decoherence. The AB effect can speed up the process for achieving coherence by inducing a phase shift of proper sign. Now one wonders whether these uh, micro or nano cavities are employed in the biological sphere for the transmutation that's observed, for instance, with Korninova and Vysotsky in biological transmutations. I've just highlighted phase of the bunch because that's going to be important when I look at some much older work. Okay, so figure one illustrates an example of system 100 for generating a coherent matter wave beam. So here's figure one in the right orientation. And so you have a B field, you have a, uh, an electric field across here, so this is a magnetic B field, and then you have your micro cavities. And over here, you emit these particles. Hmm, I wonder how they're going to emit the particles. This quantum mechanical counterpart to the well-known phenomena of self-organization observed naturally in various systems, including physical systems such as magnetic domains, as well as biological systems such as fish, birds, bees, etc. This process produces low entropy coherent matter waves with potentials unprecedented in condensed energy technologies. 
And then they're talking about the time here. In a few hundred nanoseconds, depending on the strength of the magnetic field B and the size of the cavities, a mass of coherent particles may be streaming in the entire mesh to produce coherent matter wave beam. The magnetic field B may be perpendicular to the electric field of each beam generating unit. It can be either perpendicular to the plane of view or parallel to it. Now, I was joking earlier, <laughs> how's the uh, particle beam produced or the particles? It says here, for example, beam generating unit 106 may generate stream of charged particles 108 using dielectric barrier discharge. Dielectric barrier discharge. This is the type of discharge that Ken Shoulders used for creating EVOs. This is the kind of discharge that was used by Stanislav Adamenko in his discharges. And I've noted here that this is Exotic Vacuum Object Generation 101. <laughs> According to certain aspects, the charged particles of stream 108 may be generated with substantially the same non-zero kinetic energy as one another. So when they are doing this dielectric barrier discharge, it's uh, basically you have these particles which if they are coming from a dielectric barrier discharge there is a very finite point at which the dielectric barrier breaks down the energy of the emitted particles are within a ballpark of each other and so this is in my view what they're saying here according to certain aspects the charged particles of stream 108 may be generated with substantially the same non-zero kinetic energy as one another which may allow the charged particles to achieve coherence with one another to contrast to conventional technologies where particles of coherent matter waves such as the Bose-Einstein condensate achieve the same kinetic energy by relying on cryogenics, e.g. making the kinetic energy zero so that the particles have the same zero kinetic energy. Aspects of the subject technology may produce coherent matter waves in which the charged particles of the coherent matter waves exhibit the same non-zero kinetic energy without the use of cryogenics. Now, this is quite important. This may explain why the original uh, observations of Piantelli happened in that he was discharging into nickel. One would suggest that that, with the hydrogen going over the top, would produce a dense hydrogen or highly magnetic Rydberg state hydrogen, which could cluster, maybe, and then you have this liquid or near 4 Kelvin helium coming in. Helium being a boson, it is ripe for coherence and it's also near absolute zero. That, combined with these highly magnetic structures, could have led to the original observation by Piantelli, in my view. I'm going to explain many other observations in the field in the coming months. It's all consistent theory. According to certain aspects, the magnetic field B is perpendicular to electric field, thus stream 108 which is generated within cavity 126, may be bent and directed to outside of cavity through channel opening 128 to channels 104. By directing stream 108 to channels 104, stream 108 may be combined with other streams of charged particles to produce coherent matter wave beams. So this is a way of sort of amplifying the process by having adjacent streams talk to each other during their process of becoming coherent. The charged particles of stream 108 may undergo phase synchronization with one another in response to a vector potential associated with the magnetic field B. While the streams 108 are in the channels 104, the charged particles of the streams may undergo further phase synchronization with one another to form coherent matter wave beam 12. In some aspects, the charged particles may undergo phase synchronization with one another utilizing the A-B effect. For example, the charged particles may undergo phase synchronization with one another without exchanging energy with one another. According to certain aspects, the magnetic field B may be about 100 Gauss. However, the magnetic field B may be lower or higher depending on the configuration of beam generating units. The desired size of coherent matter wave beam 
the application of coherent matter wave beam etc so by changing the magnetic field you may vary i guess the intensity or level of coherence or maybe the amount of material being cohered depending on the application according to certain aspects system 100 may produce coherent matter wave beam 112 without using cryogenics and this is because you have monochromatic uh, electrons in this case but maybe other matter involved furthermore the charged particles of the coherent matter wave beam 112 may comprise not only bosons but also fermions while conventional technologies may produce coherent matter waves in the form of bose einstein condensate which may comprise a low number of particles e.g hundreds of thousands of particles to a million particles Coherent matter wave beam 112 may comprise many more particles, e.g. at least 1 billion charged particles. And these are, you know, quite easily what you can put into an exotic vacuum object, a soliton of electrons. Even though a dynamical time-evolving solution to the state function for a B synchronization of matter waves may be difficult to obtain, Characteristic times, major viability criteria, and effectiveness measures can be worked out. And this uh, time-evolving solution is something that's talked by Tom Bearden. So these things are well understood by the time this patent was put together. And I imagine there were technologies well advanced by the time that this work was put into writing. Characteristic time to AB-induced coherence. Although a thorough quantum mechanical analysis of AB-induced coherence using least action principle for finding the characteristic time T may be a major undertaking and may be possible only through a numerical approach, implementing a major simplifying assumption for aspects of the subject technology may make it possible to estimate T with reasonable accuracy. Since the electrons may be confined to move from the cathode to the anode under the influence of the diode potential. So that's the voltage difference between the two electrodes. The paths the electrons take may be assumed to be straight lines connecting the cathode to the anode. That's definitely a useful simplification and uh, there's a lot of mass there. You can go into that if it's interesting to you. So upon substituting for these constants and the geometrical kinematical parameters for the beam at one tesla, I guess that's the field strength of one tesla. The value of beta is 1.02 times 10 to the 9 seconds, which means it can take 4 nanoseconds for this to reduce to E volt. So the characteristic time for synchronization may be approximately 4 nanoseconds. So here in summary, they are basically saying that they can synchronize, given the field of one tesla, in about four nanoseconds. So if you wanted to, for instance, use this technology to create a cloaking device and you had to move the fake thing that you are using to cloak you know if you were cloaking from something remotely four nanoseconds is faster than the eye or any camera can perceive practically for most uses and so you know this becomes a very practical technology for that application a challenge to phase synchronization of matter particles is to keep every particle at the same energy, e.g. the same wavelength, the Broglie wavelength, and shift the phase without changing the energy. Conventional methods lower the temperature to near absolute zero, e.g. to guarantee monochromaticity, and work with small number of particles. These methods require cryogenics, only work for bosons, and do not produce streaming beams, only a stationary blob. For these reasons, intense streaming beams of coherent massive particles have not been produced. Use of cryogenics for monochromatization may be cumbersome and inconsistent with beaming, as cryogenics may involve the particles being brought to the ground zero level energy for synchronization. According to various aspects of the subject technology, using the AB effect for coherence induction and using coherence growth in microcavities that combine resonance with coherence may allow the foregoing obstacles to be overcome, thereby paving the road 
for the production of energetic intense beam of coherent matter waves. Because the AB effect is a phase shifting process that does not change the energy of the particles, coherence can be achieved while keeping the wavelength the same for all particles. The number of particles may not be limited because new particles may be constantly emitted from the cathode while upstream particles may undergo synchronization. The diode action of the cavity walls may accelerate the particles to a fixed energy. Coherent beams of energetic particles may be produced at any kinetic energy by adjusting the electrode potential across the cathode wall and the anode wall. This approach may work for fermions as well as for bosons without discriminating effects. The particles need to be in the same state to synchronize. So effectively, as I understand it, what they are saying is here, as you, for instance, are emitting through your dielectric barrier discharge here a, uh, a series of charged particles, these are coming through here. And because you have a, a uh, field across here, an electric field, you're accelerating them up to a mid particular maximum velocity uh, over distance. And so they have the same kinetic energy. They are the same particle. And so therefore, the de Broglie wave would allow them to cohere by the time they get to this point over here. So you can keep feeding in um, uncoherable matter at this point, And by the time it's over here, it's able to cohere uh, relatively easily and I guess that's the point. Room temperature matter wave coherence may be beyond the reach of conventional technology. In contrast aspects of the subject technology achieve room temperature matter wave coherence that is suitable for bosons as well as fermions. According to certain aspects particles interact globally e.g. they are aware of each other without energy exchange and phases of the particles are shifted without energy exchange. In this approach, the magnetic vector potential may establish the universal energy-free link between particles and the AB effect may guarantee the energy-free phase shift. So there you have it. A system that is capable of producing coherent matter, both for fermions and bosons, uses the aronhoff bohm effect. And this is a system which is claimed by Lockheed Martin to create many of the effects that were practically observed by John Hutchison in 1979 onwards. And so this is non-local extraction of energy uh, or changing of the phase of uh, materials. If you want to get a preview of presentation topics I am developing or experimental and theoretical concepts I am considering alongside other topics I think you would be interested in, please consider subscribing to my newsletter and podcast at remoteview.icu. References discussed in this video are given in its description as are ways you can help support the work that the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project does. Thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.